All right, good afternoon, everybody. We'll talk about something a little esoteric, something probably most people here on this channel might have never even heard of, might not be aware of in the world, probably shouldn't be aware of. There's really no reason for me to be even talking about this and giving it the time of day is how I don't mean to be disrespectful because I know people who are in this world. Um, but how ridiculous, uh, from at least from the Jewish perspective, these claims are. But I did want to discuss because in a certain sense, we are guilty of a lot of the things that we would accuse uh, this group of. So if people were unaware, there's a movement uh, in the world today. Uh, it's been around in different incarnations for some time, uh, popped up here and there, kind of had somewhat of a renaissance in the 1970s, as I understand it, to the point where right now it's uh, somewhat of an established religion in the world, um, where people are, particularly people of Germanic ancestry, are uh, embracing the old Norse deities and have kind of reinvented a religion around these Old Norse deities. And, and, uh, and there are similar movements, not only among uh, these uh, followers of these, of these deities, but of others as well. And, uh, you know, meaning you'll have in Greece, some people want to, you know, abandon the Greek Orthodox Church and go and worship the ancient Greek deities and so forth. Um, but the one that I'm most familiar with as a prison chaplain, uh, and the one that I encounter the most as a prison chaplain, would be those who who have some kind of a religion built around the Old Norse deities. Uh, they might call themselves, or their movement, Asatru, or Odinism, or they'd be Odinists. Some call themselves Old Norse Pagans, or other names, Wotanists. And part of the reason why this group exists in prison, to a certain extent, would be because, um, you know, the, Oh, there is a segment of this population that's not a huge religion. I don't know how many there are in the world, but uh, probably less than 200,000 people worldwide who are devotees of this religion. And you, and you also have people who are Wiccan who might uh, also have devotion to these deities as Wiccans, but not solely as practitioners of Asatru or as Odinists or so forth. So, and, and there are many different ways that this expresses itself in the world. And part of it, um, part of the population tend to be um, there's certainly the aspect of white pride or not necessarily white pride, but pride uh, in their heritage, which I don't think is necessarily a bad thing. Uh, but sometimes, in, in some forms, it does become a, a racist or, or white power movement, or white supremacist movement and so forth, but not, not always, but sometimes uh, th there is this expression, and in prison, It'll sometimes be more like that. Um, the institution where I serve, we have several people who identify with this movement. However, they, um, uh, you know, we, I wouldn't say that they are necessarily all, you know, 
into white power or anything. They're just more interested in this as a religious lifestyle. Um, you know, the appeal is not only the racism uh, aspect, which is not central in any way to that religion, but more that it's a, a folk religion, um, an earthbound religion in a certain sense. It's uh, an old-fashioned um, and it's also one that doesn't really, it's, it can be pretty much whatever you make it into, but it, it's not this concept of eternal damnation as much focused on, it's not a dogmatic religion, and it does emphasize, uh, having fun, uh, drinking alcohol, having fun and when I compare it to the, the practices of the Native Americans so much of it is almost identical you know they'll have the drum circle um, and the, the major difference is going to be between let's say a Native American ceremony and an Asa true bloat is the Native Americans will be passing around a sacred pipe Whereas the Asatru community will be passing around a drinking horn, like a shofar, but closed on the horn end, um, filled with either ale or mead. Um, but so much of their practices are identical otherwise to what we find in the prison setting with the Native American culture and the Native American religious practices which a lot of our inmates also have adopted. Now, another fascinating thing, so why am I talking about this? Well, the reason is really because right now with the coronavirus, part of my work, I mean, we've, we've been ministering to these men for before this, uh, this, uh, I, I'm not going to say it's because of the coronavirus. I'm going to say it's because of the reaction to the coronavirus. Uh, because I don't, I don't believe it's actually the, the virus itself, but rather the way we're choosing to react to it. But that's neither here nor there. That's not the point right now. But we, I managed to, in the prison, we'll, well, we'll talk about this, you know, what, what I've been dealing with in, in the prison what happened at first was I read about a Wiccan high priest who volunteers in some other prisons and I wanted to see if maybe we could get him to come volunteer in our prison and what we realized was that it wasn't going to be only the Wiccans but it would be the Odinists who also want to have this volunteer come in and he expressed himself that he is of Norse ancestry and believes himself to be kin to these Norse deities as well, and but he is, a, so he is a, a, a Wiccan high priest in a Wiccan coven, but also participates in Asatru practices. And what I didn't realize was when we started this group, was that we had both, um, both the the Wiccans and Odinists participating in this one shared pagan group and that we actually had more Odinists than Wiccans. Now, I'd heard of Wicca for a long time, didn't know much about it, but I really only knew about Odinism as a prison cult, you know, essentially was how I would you know, would have known of it similar to, let's say, perceptions of groups like Nation of Islam or uh, Moorish Science Temple and things like that that uh, really have a, a wide presence in prisons. And a lot of people join these particular religions when they're in prison. Not to say that everybody who's part of these communities are, are attached to prison, but that's where as a prison chaplain, you're going to 
come across these religions that you don't come across that much in the street. Um, whereas Wicca, you you hear more about it. You know, it gets a lot more attention in the in the popular culture. Uh, again, but people don't know much about it. But we we know that it's out there. You know, whereas you really most people have never heard of you know Christians, Jews, Muslims never heard of this of this religion, and so. What I realized was, you know, we had like 25 men who were signed up to, to, or maybe a little bit less than that, to participate in this um, shared pagan group. And then they turned out that uh, over 15, maybe 17, 18 of them were Odinists. And they at one point then said they wanted their own group. They were happy with the volunteer that we had for him to lead and teach them but they wanted to have one time that was just for the Odinists and one time just for the Wiccans what later happened was that this Wiccan high priest was no longer able to participate uh, volunteer in the prison because of his work schedule and so then I went on a mission to try to find a volunteer for the Asatru Odinist community and lo and behold I found somebody meaning this um, the Wiccan high priest was traveling some 40 miles I believe he was coming maybe once or twice a month I think he was coming once a month to our prison twice a month to some of the other prisons uh, and the other prisons were closer to his home so that's why I told him you know once a month is good enough uh, as a volunteer he could come when he wants uh, so I wasn't expecting more than that and he said he could maybe come twice a month and then he couldn't come anymore so then I found an Odinist chieftain I guess his, his title is Gothi and the Gothi who we hired I didn't hire he's a volunteer he's not a he's not a hired chaplain he's not a contracting chaplain He's a volunteer, but that we took on as a volunteer. He only lived maybe 10 miles away from from our prison. And uh, I got to know this guy, a nice guy. We got along very well. Now with the coronavirus restrictions, they're not allowing any volunteers to come in. So then the Wiccan volunteers said, well, now he's not working. He could come back. I was like, yeah, but they're not letting anybody inside. In the meantime, but we had to do something because these guys are, um, they still want their program. And really what we're doing now in the prison is we're showing videos, YouTube videos. We, you know, I, maybe I shouldn't say we download them. There are websites where you can download from YouTube. We download them and then, uh, upload them to OneDrive that's shared with the DOC, convert the file to DVD file, we use another website for that, and then burn it to a DVD, and then I give it to the control center in the prison, and they show every day a religious, two hours of religious programming for every religion. So Wednesday, for example, I have two hours of Jewish videos, and sometimes I'll have some of my videos, not the political ones, but the religious ones, particularly ones that I uh, delivered in synagogue and so forth, um, I, not ones I'm talking in the car, usually, although it shouldn't matter. Uh, so we put those up, uh, as well as many other Jewish videos. Um, that's on, on Wednesday. And on Thursday, which is Thor's Day, Wednesday is Odin's Day, and Thursday is Thor's Day, um, so Thursday we show the Odinist videos, and Friday we show Muslim videos, and you know, which would be around the Juma time. And Sunday we show Catholic and Protestant videos. Actually, our our Protestant pastor records his own message that we share. Monday we show Buddhist, what we call Eastern traditions. It includes Buddhism, Hinduism, it could be Jainism, Sikhism. We haven't really had any of those. We had some Taoist videos in the morning and in the afternoon the Native American videos 
and then Tuesday morning we show Wiccan videos, and Tuesday in the afternoon we show Jehovah's Witness videos. So that's pretty much the whole week, and each group gets about a two-hour block of religious programming. The, pr the thing is, is that now, if I'm showing this, I have to actually watch these videos, and I actually... That was important because some of these videos actually were not appropriate. I was really more worried about the Odinist videos, but then uh, because I was worried that maybe it might have some, you know, white nationalist tendencies or something. And in general, my approach is I don't want I, I if, if they're talking about something that's positive for their own community, I don't have a problem about that. It's only when they're talking down negatively about others in a particularly in a violent way um, but if they're just criticizing other communities and saying why they're different I'm uh, you know I, I have to maybe find some guidance on that but I've been pretty much allowing that and that but with that being said well then I, I thought the Wiccan videos they're all peaceful and everything the Wiccan videos t turned out to be the ones they couldn't show for other reasons <laughs> And we, and I've been watching all these videos, listening to them at least. Usually, I'm learning while uh, you know learning Gemara or something on Safari while I'm listening to these videos. So then, what I realized was the wicked videos. The problem wasn't what they were saying, but what was shown on the screen. But we won't talk about that. Uh, but I had to pull those, uh, some of them, and find you know replacement. But with the Odinist videos, the one thing that I've been hearing constantly is that their issue is not, um, you know, they feel that they have been disenfranchised of their religion by, by Christianity. Christianity came and supplanted their religion and forced their people to leave the religion. And they, I've I've heard many different speakers now over the past few weeks, once a week, and I try to kind of change it up a little bit, give them a variety of speakers. Um, one who I like to have is one who I don't think is of their faith. It's just that he's a scholar of, of Old Norse studies, is Dr. Jackson Crawford, uh, who's a guy about my age, and he has his PhD, he's a professor of Old Norse Studies, and he makes these YouTube videos, and he has his PhD and everything, and it's, he dresses like a cowboy, and it's funny, because um, there was someone on YouTube who actually made a video making fun of him, just, you know, imitating him, and I actually thought it was kind of funny, but I know that when I'm showing Jackson Crawford, I'm not, I don't have to worry about racism, because he doesn't, I don't think he actually believes in this stuff, I mean, he said he's not us a true faith, he won't say what his actual religious views are, but he says he has them, but it doesn't matter. But I know the members of that us a true community enjoy his translations and, and respect him. Uh, but I was listening to some of the other speakers, and that's and the theme that's been coming up. There was one speaker who's actually Scandinavian, I believe Swedish, who said that actually the uh, Norse pagans had no problem adding Jesus into their pantheon. Their issue was the, um, you know, the, that he, you know, the exclusivity was somewhat the problem, but the major problem was that the forced conversions. But the other issue that was, they kept bringing up was that, you know, a lot of, that was this one Arith Hager, I think his name, but then some of the other, the American ones, they were saying, you know, here they're being forced to adopt this desert god, uh, and they would rather follow the gods of the deciduous forest, pretty much. And one even said, you know, the desert is a, a nasty place to live, it's a lousy place, and that's why, you know, these people are so, um, you know, the Christians, the Judeo-Christian ethic is so miserable and, and, you know, misogynistic and so forth. And 
you know, seeing, you know, the world as evil, seeing women as evil, so forth. And and if you live in the desert, that's just how it is. And that's uh, and then the other speaker said, you know, it was Akhenaten who created monotheism, and uh, and and it wasn't uh, a natural organic religion the way that their religion was more of a natural organic religion. How Christianity was more man-made. And I felt like I, I need to um, debunk these claims that they're making. So, first of all, is this claim that Akhenaten, this was the Norian society was claiming this, that Akhenaten invented monotheism. Um, Akhen, nobody knew who Akhenaten was until about a hundred years ago. It's just that they found all of this stuff. So this claim that this this pharaoh who was totally wiped out of the history and, and was only rediscovered recently was the one who invented monotheism is just absurd. And, and also, why would the Hebrews claim to not be Egyptian in origin if that was the case? Why would they claim that they came from, that Abraham came from Babylonia, from the Chaldean area, moved to um, to Canaan, then his children, grand, great-grandchildren went down to Egypt, his grandson, and, and, and their family went down to Egypt if that's all that this was, you know, if, if it was actually an Egyptian invention. Uh, and also the ideology of Judeo-Christian monotheism is radically different than the ideology of um, what we know about Akhenaten. Akhenaten worshipped just one god, but not in the way of how we recognize only one god. And then this idea that it's a desert god, again, goes along with that idea. But it's clear from the Bible that the Bible understood it, that maybe people thought of it that way, but in actuality, uh, it was clear that the Bible understood that the God of Israel is the God of the universe, uh, is the one true God. And so then... Um, but, you know, that's pretty much what I wanted to debunk there, is that it wasn't, you know, this idea it was not invented. No, the, the Jewish explanation of how uh, polytheism developed was that, you know, people started, you know, everyone knew there was one God. Adam and Eve knew. No one knew. They spoke to him. They were, they were prophets of his. What happened was, was that people started to create cults to venerate other beings, other creations that that the Creator God made, and and then and eventually they forgot about God Himself. They thought the way Maimonides explains it, you know, they thought, you know, how do you honor a king? You honor the king by also honoring his his servants, his ministers, and so forth. And so cults developed to venerate the sun and the moon and various angels, or perhaps some demons, and so forth. Uh, I mean, Maimonides mentions that there's a species of angels that are called gods. And then there's another species that are called the children of gods. Um, and, and these are mentioned in Scripture, but that these are not God in the sense of the Creator God, who is, uh, uh, Maimonides makes very clear, is a totally different being, is something that is the first cause, an unmovable mover, um, and that when these beings are called by these names, it's it's a borrowed term, or really, better yet, is that when the true God is called God, it's really more of a borrowed term. So again, it's not to deny the existence of these other beings, but just to say that they're not worthy of worship. The interesting thing is that the Asa true followers say they don't worship their gods, they have fellowship with their gods, with their deities. Um, they see them uh, similar, like uh, patron saints. This is how the Wiccans approach as well. Um, they have patron deities. 
Okay, the difference that I've seen though is that the Wiccans will say there is one divinity and that everything else is just cultural archetypes. Some of the Asatru people will say that these gods don't even actually exist other than as Jungian archetypes. Um, so I can, I can hear where that's coming from culturally and so forth, but the problem is the denial of our creator, I meaning because the Native Americans recognize the creator, and they say that the, who they recognize as the creator, that's the same God that the Jews and the Christians worship. Um, it seems like the Asatru people don't recognize that. Now, on a personal level, I don't care. You can believe whatever you want, and if this makes you a better person, I don't care. Because Malachi says, from the rising of the sun to saying, there of great is my name among the nations, says the Lord of hosts. Everywhere they're offering a name, uh, offering it's to my name. It's a pure offering. So uh, if these people, that's how they connect to the supreme beam, to, to a higher force, and they're, and it inspires them to be moral and ethical, it's none of my business. As long as they're not claiming to call it Judaism or something, which they're definitely not, they don't want anything to do with anything Jewish. Obviously, um, although uh, the, the the Gothi who we have is a big fan of Mel Brooks, um, but uh, and so he has respect for Jews. He doesn't hate Jews, and he doesn't. He just he has a different approach. But I, you know, I just wanted to bring up our answer to those claims that they make, um, which to most Jewish people it just seems so silly and ridiculous. Um, I shouldn't even be giving them the time of day, but it, it's what I have to deal with at work. So, um, but which is fine. I, I feel that uh, as a chaplain, that's what I'm supposed to be doing and I'm doing my job. So thank you for watching. God bless. Please like, share and subscribe. Comment. We'll see you later.